Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter in Washington. I never got any money from you. This is The Saucer Life, a podcast in which we examine concepts, events, or people orbiting the world of flying saucers. Few preconceptions, snark when justified, no belief, no debunking. Today, we're going to look at one of the one of the key conspiratorial figures of the mid to late 1970s into the early 1980s, and he's somebody who you might not have heard about, or if you've heard about him, you might not have read his material or listened to the nearly 100 audio cassettes that he sent out over his career to his fever pitch, fanatical listening audience. Um, but his name is Dr. Peter David Beter. And he is a fascinating figure. And uh, this was a, a listener request. And I've been wanting to cover Dr. Beter for a while. And I also knew that after the, the epic Bill Moore MUFON speech episode last time that I would be looking for something a little lighthearted, <laughs> simpler, uh, straightforward, although it, it really isn't. I, I think shorter is the word I'm looking for here, really. So uh, Dr. Beter, Dr. Peter Beter, let's go. I probably shouldn't say Dr. Peter Beter too often because I don't want the show to get flagged as explicit or be considered anything other than roughly family friendly. So before we get into Dr. Beter and his ideas, we need to do a little bit of background on anti-communist conspiracy theories and uh, anti, oh gosh, I don't even know what to call it, anti-elitist conspiracy theories in uh, in the Cold War period. Um, it's fun. It's fun, really. So, in 1964, a book came out by a man named John Stormer called None Dare Call It Treason, and it became a classic of anti-communist conspiracism. Now, to be clear, I, I need to make clear that by anti-communist conspiracism, I, I don't mean a, a sort of late 40s, early 50s concern that there were literal communist spies operating espionage networks in the United States, because there had been. And, and although by the time of the McCarthyist sort of witch hunts, uh, a lot of those those things have been kind of cleared up already. Um, you know, that that's a different sort of paranoia than the more sort of conspiracy theory-ish paranoia that would emerge later. So in his book, None Dare Call It Treason, Stormer asserted that the growth of the communist-controlled world had led to, in his words, the hidden tentacles of the communist conspiracy exerting unmeasured influence over the rest of the world. And he asks, where have we failed? Stormer argued that a number of factors contributed to a sense that the Soviet Union could perhaps win the Cold War. These concerns included a lessening of anti-communist sentiment since the early 1950s, American involvement in the United Nations, and a lack of public information and education about the goals of international communism. Now, these things, Stormer argued, paved the way for a slow but steady communist victory in the United States. Stormer frames his concerns about the actual depth of the conspiracy as a question. Is there a conspiratorial plan to destroy the United States into which foreign aid, planned inflation, distortion of treaty-making powers, and disarmament all fit? This question divides many knowledgeable and dedicated conservatives. They waste time and effort and split their ranks with senseless debate. It doesn't really matter whether the parts have been planned for an assembly line revolution, or if they are the work of well-meaning but misguided idealists. So in something that is actually kind of unusual for a lot of conspiracy theorists, Stormer is not concerned about the actual nature of the conspiracy. For, for him, spending time on determining how exactly 
any conspiracy might work takes valuable time and resources away from educating the general public about the actual problem going on, the actual communist influence around the world and in the United States, which he sort of summarizes as things like sort of manufactured fake inflation to keep people poor, um, treaties that are not properly negotiated and ratified that put the United States at a disadvantage and things like uh, foreign aid and things like that. So in something that is actually kind of unusual for a lot of conspiracy theorists, Stormer is not concerned about the actual nature of the conspiracy. For, for him, spending time on determining how exactly any conspiracy might work takes valuable time and resources away from educating the general public about the actual problem going on, the actual communist influence around the world and in the United States, which he sort of summarizes as things like sort of manufactured fake inflation to keep people poor, um, treaties that are not properly negotiated and ratified that put the United States at a disadvantage and things like uh, foreign aid and things like that. Now, other writers later would spend a huge amount of time looking into the detailed nature of the apparent conspiracy. In 1971, oh, I should say, I should say this here. Um, John Stormer's book, None Dare Call It Treason, was the first conspiracy theory book I ever read. I was um, probably 15 and I was a freshman in high school and it was in our school library, um, sort of buried in the back, uh, kind of a beat up paperback. And I, I remember reading it and this would have been, this would have been 1990 or so. Um, so it, it, a lot of the stuff he said about, about communism, you know, being, being triumphant and, and invading the United States, you know, had you know, begun to ring very hollow by then. So I didn't find it particularly, uh, particularly um, persuasive at that point. So anyway, in 1971, Gary Allen wrote a book that uh, sort of ripped off Stormer's book title. He called it None Dare Call It Conspiracy. And it focuses more extensively on what would become, within a few decades, the well-worn, paranoid tropes of a central banking conspiracy pointing to the Rothschild and Warburg families and J.P. Morgan as key figures in an effort to create the Federal Reserve System, long a bugbear of uh, conspiracy thinkers. Allen also adhered to a, a more conspiratorial view of history than Stormer did. Um, Stormer was very focused on the post-World War II Cold War context. Um, Allen says, quote, while all the standard reasons given for the outbreak of World War I were doubtless factors, there were also more important causes. The conspiracy had been planning the war for over two decades. Yes, the conspiracy. Uh, who are the conspiracy? Allen focuses on the role of political and cultural insiders. That's his term, insiders. Um, and he sing singles out the Council on Foreign Relations and the Bilderberger Organization singles out those insiders as having a role in shaping foreign policy in ways that are detrimental to the United States, but beneficial for the goals of global control. Yes, the insiders have no aversion to working with the communists whose ostensible goal is to destroy them. While the insiders are serving champagne and caviar to their guests in their summer mansions at Newport or entertaining other members of the social elite aboard their yachts, their agents are out enslaving and murdering people, and you are next on their list. It should not be surprising to learn that there is on the international level an organizational equivalent of the Council on Foreign Relations. This group calls itself the Bilderbergers. If scarcely one American in a thousand has any familiarity with the CFR, it is doubtful that one in five thousand has any knowledge of the Bilderbergers. Again, this is not accidental. So how do these international groups of insiders, the Council on Foreign Relations, the, the Bilderbergers, how do these interface with American policymaking and contribute to the plan to enslave us all? 
Allen observes that prominent members of both the Republican and Democratic parties are members of the Council on Foreign Relations, along with officials from many key corporations, giving lie to the supposed division with the American political system. Um, If you've seen sort of complaints about it's a uniparty, there's no difference between the two parties. This is not a new a new issue or a new complaint. A key part of this entire insider system was the Rockefeller family. From its roots with John D. Rockefeller, whom Allen connects with J.P. Morgan and the Rothschilds, to its contemporary descendants and their influence in the Nixon administration, politicians like Nelson Rockefeller and David Rockefeller, for example. Allen identified individuals and organizations that readers could pretty easily track just by reading their daily newspapers. So what he does, and this is a, a pretty popular book. This wasn't you know, something just, just sold at gun shows and, and like in back alleys. People are able to become their own conspiracy theorists in their own living rooms. They can keep track of who is doing what and which Rockefellers are saying which things. Like, for example, when the Watergate scandal happens and Nixon resigns and Gerald Ford becomes president. Who does he appoint and who does the Senate confirm as the new vice president? Nelson Rockefeller. So, you know, people are paying attention to these things. And into this milieu comes Peter David Beter. So he, he he's an interesting guy. He might have been considered one of these insiders at the time. Um, this is the bio from the peterdavidbeater.com website, which still exists and is a fantastic resource as long as all you're looking for is stuff about Dr. Beater. Dr. Beater was general counsel for the Export Import Bank of Washington a candidate for the governorship of West Virginia, co-founded Sodesmir, a mineral exploration company in Zaire. He represented American gas utilities building a pipeline under the length of Argentina, represented mining interests in underwater manganese nodule exploration in the Pacific, was featured at financial seminars in New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Toronto, Montreal, Geneva, and other international financial centers. As a political and economic commentator, Dr. Beter worked with Wall Street luminaries, including Franz Pick, Edward Durrell, Colonel Curtis Dahl, Norman Dodd, Emmanuel Josephson, and many others. He wrote prolifically, including his book, Conspiracy Against the Dollar. Through his tapes, Beter influenced various people, such as the 1980s punk band The Wanderers. In the controversial Crusaders comic book series published by Jack T. Chick, Double Cross, Alberto, Part 2, Peter Beter is cited as a reliable authority on why the body count changed in the wake of the Jonestown Massacre. Dr. Beter's doctorate was legitimate in the sense that he had a Juris Doctor degree, meaning he had been to law school. Uh, Generally, lawyers with a JD are not referred to as doctor, but sometimes they do because it kind of boosts their, their profile a bit. And also, because we won't get to every one of Dr. Beter's ideas here, his theory of, or his the, the reference to the Jonestown Massacre, he said that it was staged to camouflage a joint U.S.-Israeli military operation to take out a Soviet missile base in Guyana. The, the people who were killed at Jonestown were not part of any sort of death cult. Rather, those were the bodies of everybody killed in the raid. Um, and this was a, a scam to prevent people from knowing about the Soviet missile base. Peter believed that the Western Hemisphere was filled with secret Soviet nuclear missile bases all aimed at the United States that the insiders were not telling us about because it was part of the Rockefeller plan to eventually destroy America. His book, Conspiracy Against the Dollar, basically um, b- basically blames the stagflation of the 1970s ask your parents, kids, um, on the manipulation of gold and the actual sort of stealing of gold from the United States. Who stole the gold from the United States? Well, the Rockefeller family, of course. This was detailed in a newspaper article um, in the California Desert Sun, the October 7th, 1974 Uh, edition. There's an article about basically how the Rockefeller, nobody likes the Rockefellers, is basically the point of the story. One Rockefeller detractor, Peter Beter, even charged that the gold in Fort Knox had been spirited away in the dead of night only to wind up in the European vaults of David Rockefeller. 
This charge was proved to be erroneous as Mary T. Brooks, director of the U.S. Mint, conducted a group of congressmen on a rare visit to the Kentucky vaults. Yes, the gold was there and intact. Peter would, maybe predictably, claim that this proved nothing because he was, very mysteriously and suspiciously, not allowed to go along on the inspection of the Fort Knox vaults. So Dr. Beter would communicate with his followers, his, I don't want to say disciples, but the people who paid attention to him, through audio tapes. Um, these were a thing that used to exist and still do. They're, they're making a comeback, which is deeply stupid. It's not like vinyl. Vinyl had a distinct sound that was pleasant. Cassette tapes were stupid. Uh, and Anyway, um, Dr. Beter sent out tapes, usually monthly, but uh, not always. Sometimes he would be waylaid by illness or conspirators or something. But this is how his first audio letter began. Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Peter speaking. Today is June 21, 1975, and this is my monthly audio letter number one. A lot of things have been happening lately that probably have you concerned and puzzled. Things like the Mayagas affair, the prospect of financial collapse of New York City with domino effects throughout the economy, and so on. And all of these things are important. But what I hope to do in my monthly reports to you is to try to focus your attention squarely on the most basic developments. Understanding these most basic matters will, I believe, enable you increasingly to grasp the significance of details in the news yourself. And once the American public can see through the daily diet of clever, subtle propaganda which is served up by the major media as news when it really is not news at all, then the jig will be up for those who are trying to take our country and our freedom away from us. In this audio letter, I therefore want to discuss just three topics. One, an important matter concerning evidence on the Fort Knox Gold scandal. Two, recent indications from President Ford that the plans for economic depression and dictatorship in America are still on track. And an introduction to our next President and would-be dictator. Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller. This is a pretty good sampling of the types of topics he covered, especially early on in the uh, series of, of audio letters. There were, there was Nelson Rockefeller is going to be a dictator. There is an economic collapse and something about Fort Knox. My favorite Peter Beater Fort Knox theory is that there was a plan to um, use nuclear material to irradiate the gold in Fort Knox to crash the economy. Yes, that is remarkably similar to aspects of the plot of the Bond film and novel Goldfinger. So how is this economic crash Rockefeller takeover supposed to work? This plan is for the United States to be manipulated into terrible economic straits by Election Day 1976 so as to complete the collapse of confidence in our free way of life that has been fostered increasingly through educational and other means for decades. On Election Day 1976, we are to vote, among other things, in a referendum, not a customary procedure at all here in America, to scrap our present Constitution and accept a new one in its stead. The new Constitution, which is to be the subject of an audio book I plan to tape soon, has already been written and would totally reorganize our government along totalitarian lines and abolish free enterprise in favor of total governmental control and regulation. So as you may know, uh, Nelson Rockefeller never became president. He was Gerald Ford's vice president during Gerald Ford's term. And actually, Rockefeller didn't even survive uh, politically to be Ford's running mate when he ran in 1976. Ford went with, uh, went with Bob Dole. So 
Jimmy Carter gets elected in 1976. What's the deal with that? Why would Jimmy Carter be president when the Rockefellers are in control? Well, because the Rockefellers were controlling Jimmy Carter, obviously. Who was Carter's key foreign policy advisor? That's right, a guy named Brzezinski. What does Brzezinski do in his spare time? He's the director of the powerful Trilateral Commission on behalf of David Rockefeller. So, you know, the Rockefellers are behind everything. But one of the things I like about Beater's tapes is that he always lays out at the beginning, after a little introduction, three things he's going to talk about. Here's some examples of those three things. My three topics today are topic number one. Conspiracy for economic destruction. Topic number two, conspiracy for political destruction. And topic number three, conspiracy to achieve destruction of human lives. Now, lest you think this is all just sort of political and especially economic conspiracy, I'm going to look at two topics in particular that Beter became probably the most well-known for. If anybody knows about Dr. Beter, they look at two things. The first is something called the Battle of the Harvest Moon, and the second is something called the War of the Doubles, or the topic of organic robotoids. And we're going to look at those two things after our break. If you like The Saucer Life and you want more, you can support us in exchange for bonus content and all kinds of things. Patrons get the episodes before everybody else, and there are a few pieces of bonus content that show up every month. Recently, we've done some watch-alongs of classic episodes of the uh, Dragnet with Flying Saucers show Project UFO. We've uh, explored the alien love life of Bob Brunaud a bit more deeply and looked at what happens when you ask ChatGPT to invent a contactee story. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting more stuff, you can check it out at patreon.com slash chizomedia or via the link in the show notes. You can also check out past episodes at saucerlife.com or your favorite podcast app. Uh, there's, gosh, pushing 200 of them so far. It's, 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 it's gotten out of control. And as, as always, we're on Twitter and Instagram at Saucer Life. You can also email us at thesaucerlife at gmail.com or contact us by post at Chizo Media, P.O. Box 68, Grand Blank, Michigan, 48480. And one of the things we would like always in correspondence is feedback on the most recent episode, which we sort of go over uh, here during the midway segment of the show. And we got a lot of feedback from uh, our MUFON 89 episode. So uh, let's uh, let's get into that. And I did ask uh, if, if for people to, if they liked, uh, let us know what they would have done if they were in uh, Bill Moore's situation there in the in the early 1980s. Would they have provided some feedback to the powers that be on the effect their disinformation was having, uh, or would they uh, they have you know done something done something different? So let's go ahead and dive into uh, dive into that correspondence and and I'll try to keep track of where everybody uh, is communi- what how everybody is communicating with me. I think the screenshots I have here will allow me to do that. So now in no particular order, here we go. Um, commenting on the uh, Saucer Life website, Rob says, have read Project Beta and Mirage Mend and am puzzled as to why Doty, Moore, etc. did this. Ben and worked worked as a government contractor and apparently was a traditional conservative patriotic pro-military type. Wouldn't it have made more sense to just say basically, yeah, we're experimenting with some fancy new tech here. Can't tell you about it, but be quiet. Do your patriotic duty, and when we can, we'll sort you out with some lucrative work in the future. Instead, they waged a campaign of psychological warfare against the guy. Was it because he was already into UFO stuff and they ascertained secretly that he was prone to mental health issues and they just decided to push them along? Nothing really makes sense in the UFO intelligence crossover world. 
That's a good question. Um, I think part of it is that just just from what I read and, and how I read things and, and how things appeared to me as I read things, and this might not be entirely correct, I kind of wonder if Benowitz would have already been – so he was, if he was already all in on the UFO – aspect of it with the work with the abductee he was uh, he was involved with and and things like that i'm wondering if he would have believed them if they said you know it's it's you know secret keep 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 it under your hat we'll we'll hook you up with more work later i wonder if if they would have ended up having to to do something additional down the road if he was already sort of in that ufo zone i think Maybe, perhaps, there's an element of wanting to know sort of or to study or to examine how disinformation could spread within the UFO community, maybe just as a case study, perhaps, or or a way to have some avenues set up in the future if and when they needed to disinform people. Maybe. I don't know. Paul over on the Patreon says, one question, prior to Moore's speech, why were John Lear and his flunkies so opposed to the MJ-12 narrative? Seems like it would have validated their government conspiracy claims. Oh, that's a good question as well. Um, and it's it's one of those things where there's a lot of conversation and things going back and forth and in speeches and in internet posts that's – or pre-internet posts that's hard to um hard to piece together my impression has always been that the uh the, the lear english cooper wing of things believed MJ, mj12 was was kind of a a smokescreen to hide just how deep and wide the conspiracy was. Uh, MJ12 said there is a there is a control group that's that's managing these things, um, and that would people would go down that avenue and and not maybe listen to the abduction implant underground base wing of it. Um, honestly, I think part of it's probably that it, it took it took attention away from John Lear. This is. This is documentation. Moore and Chandere and, and, and Friedman had documentation that they were actively investigating. What what did Lear have? Lear had, you know, lots of people are saying and things like that. Paul continues, uh, what would I do in his shoes? It's hard to say. If it's the 1980s, without decades and decades of accrued cynicism about the government and everything we've learned since then about domestic Cold War disinformation, then yeah, I'd have shared his reasoning and taken the deal. From the vantage point of 2023, I'd like to think I'd be more circumspect, but given the right offer, I don't know if that would be the case. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think especially in terms of UFO stuff, we're a lot more cynical about government disinformation. Uh, in 1980, we we'd had – Vietnam and the Pentagon Papers and Watergate and the Church Committee. I, I think in general, um, there's there's some cynicism that uh, that had built about the government and about the intelligence uh, community. But uh, within that that actual sort of specific UFO context, yeah, I, I can absolutely see that. Laura, also over on uh, Patreon, says, I view Moore's speech as a watershed moment for ufology because of the doubt he cast on big theories like underground bases and alien implants. Even if you think he was a crank or a double disinformation agent, his revelations should still make you think twice about the reality of the theories. Also, his comments on ufology remain true to this day. I recently listened to some current opinions on the 2022 UAP report and thought those individuals would do well to revisit Moore's 1989 speech. Yes, it is uncanny and a bit eerie how relevant a lot of that uh, remains today. Uh, Laura continues, as for what I would do in his shoes, honestly, I think I would probably do the same. The stakes were so high. Can you imagine being the person who finally achieved disclosure? Of course, distrust of the Air Force already existed at the time, but I don't think the culture of distrust was nearly as strong as it would become after the Benowitz affair. I would like to believe that I would have given up the gig earlier as soon as it became apparent that it was having such a negative effect on Paul. The truth, if it existed, would still be there to be discovered another day, and perhaps Paul could have remained a whole person. Indeed, it seems that Moore's speech was motivated by his guilt. 
As an aside, I now have a life goal to be in a position to begin a speech addressing both my friends and my adversaries. You and me both, Laura. Absolutely. Um, in email, um, in email, uh, Lester, correspondent Lester, um, asks, did the Weekly World News cover Moore's speech? I can't remember. Was Ed Anger pig-biting mad? Did Sophie Sabak write, I told you so? I do not believe the Weekly World News covered it. I, I think by 1989, they had moved on from <laughs> legitimate journalism. Um, at, they, they weren't covering those sorts of things as much, but I would love to hear Ed Anger's take on um, – on Bill Moore, I think that would be uh, that would be great. Red Pill Junkie comments on the website. To me personally, the situation becomes indefensible the moment Benowitz started to deteriorate and became a danger to himself with others. Imagine if he'd committed suicide at his frustration of failing to stop the alien invasion, or worse, imagine this whole thing had happened in the 2020s instead of the 1980s, and Benowitz had gone into a kind of shooting rampage that have turned all too common to even bother report in the United States. Far-fetched, no one can say that in the age of QAnon anymore. All of that would have been on Moore's hands, because at the end of the day, he valued his chance to learn whatever he could about how the government dealt with the UFO issue more than whatever repercussions would befall Paul Benowitz, a man who considered him a friend and welcomed him into his home. Just how anyone can look at himself in the mirror after playing something like that is beyond me. Some would say that kind of grayscale attitude is what's needed to win wars and be successful at espionage, which is why I'll never make good James Bond material, I guess. Another comment on the website. Uh, that it, then as now for uh, let me start reading that again then as now folks sure do love their misinformation i love my infor- misinformation as for the misinformation of others i'm not so sure but a very informative podcast installment as usual yeah it's it is a tricky question i think it's interesting that that a lot of people so far aren't really exactly sure what they do Another, I think this is the last comment from the website. Uh, Matthew says, I just finished my copy of Wayward Sons and of Mirage Men in the Mail to me. So the timing of this episode was spot on and is one of my all-time favorites. Well done. Thank you. As to what would I do? I'd like to pretend I'd be wiser, but in the moment, to be in, to be an active participant and maybe learn something? Hard to say. Alexandra over on the Patreon says, with friends like Bill, Paul doesn't need enemies. I hope that if I were ever in Moore's position, I would decline the offer. Michael on the Patreon says, I think on some level, Moore seems to have done ufologists a bit of a favor, at least the more skeptical ones. For example, I found Pilkington's book made me feel he was kind of replacing the hunt for aliens with a hunt for disinformation campaigns. I also wonder how much the disinformation actually contributed to Benowitz's mental health troubles. It doesn't cha- really change the ethics of the situation, but I was left wondering if he'd, had, if he'd have ended up where he was on his own. That is a good question. Um, it, it, it's, it's a good question and, so, and a question that is sort of raised and discussed in some of the, the literature that's out there. And I, I don't know. I don't know either. I don't think – Moore's um, or the disinformation campaign, Moore was not the only one involved, of course. Uh, I don't think that helped in any case. Baird on the Patreon says, uh, based on everything that's happened ever since the Tic Tac video showed up, it looks like the question to ask is who in the community wouldn't make a deal like Moore? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, Doc Pinko says, I probably would have participated. My thinking would be, we make so many day-to-day compromises in our lives, this is just another one. Plus, I'd hoped, I hoped I'd try to surreptitiously warn Benowitz. I'd be the patsy, unfortunately. We've got one more comment from Sam on the website that came in just as I was getting ready to record this. If I was Bill Moore, I'd take it. Other comments on this webpage eloquently point out the shoddy ethics, but in a field that largely consists of blind alleys, rumors, and funhouse mirrors, the desire to get info from what you desperately want to believe is the source would be incredibly powerful. Reinforcing my view here is that people in general get a kick out of the idea of being part of a secret, privileged, knowing elite. Everyone likes to feel special, and I think there are a lot of paranormal researchers who would be sorely tempted if they were approached by the men in black and told, you know too much. Now we need to recruit you. Here's your black suit. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think I was sort of thinking, you know, as I posed this question 
to you all out there in audience land, I was um, thinking, you know, sort of what would I do in that situation? And I, I don't know. I, I think I would probably, I think the most honest way for me to answer this is to say, I would say, yes, I will give you information on the effect that this disinformation is having and, and what I'm hearing in the UFO community. I, um, I would probably, through bad note-taking and laziness, be really kind of bad at it, um, and they probably would find somebody else. So I'm not sure I would get to the point where I would see Benowitz's deterioration. I probably would have been quietly dropped from the project by then as um, – I would probably be pretty late with filing reports and and things like that. But I honestly, I, I probably would, I probably would say yes. I, I probably would say, hey, I can. Th- this, they wouldn't be asking me to do this if they didn't have a legitimate, important reason to do so. And I would like to be, uh, as one of you mentioned, kind of an insider. That would be kind of cool. Um, I would have a, a real problem. Seeing the effect on uh, on Benowitz, though, and I would probably, I would probably bail. Um, I would probably bail at some point. Um, I don't think I'd become some sort of whistleblower telling everybody what happened. I I don't think I would have you know done anything like that. I would probably have a healthy respect for the way that people in certain positions can make people like me disappear pretty quickly, but. Um, I I think that uh, I think that I probably would have taken the bait. I, I probably I probably would have been a patsy as well. I, I think a lot of people would. Okay, thank you so much for your feedback. And uh, on that episode, it seemed to be um, seemed to go over well with people. I'm glad I finally uh, finally did it and got it out of the way. So for now, let's get back to Doctor Beater. <laughs> The Battle of the Harvest Moon is something that happened in September of 1977, and it represents a real turn in Beter's thinking about conspiracy and the Rockefellers and what is going on. In 1976, Beter had warned that things were not going as well for the Rockefellers as many suspected they would. People who are on the Boards of trustees of major Rockefeller-controlled foundations were worried that the Rockefellers' plan for world domination was, you know, going off the tracks. And they were right. This month, September 1977, has witnessed the beginning of the end for the Rockefellers and also for America as we know it. On the night of the harvest moon, September 27, 1977, The most decisive battle of the 20th century ended in a stunning upset. This battle, known only to a handful of individuals in the world, was the culmination of the great secret race in superweapons, which I reveal to you in AUDIO LETTER 20 for January 1977. And my friends, the Soviet Union won. Now the Soviet Union is mobilizing for war. Confident at last, the Rockefeller cartel can no longer stand in their way as they conquer the entire world. The four Rockefeller brothers, having set the world on its present disastrous course, can no longer do anything about what is about to happen. My three topics for today are Topic number 1, War in Space. The Battle of the Harvest Moon, September 27, 1977. Topic number two, The Last Days of the Rockefeller Empire. And topic number three, The American Dream in Memoriam. Basically, the story of the Battle of the Harvest Moon is this. The entire space race has been mostly for show. It has been a contest between the Rockefeller family and the Soviet Union for domination. And one aspect of this domination was not the the race to build huge nuclear 
arsenals or neutron bombs or things like that. It was the race to develop laser technology and beyond that, particle beam technology, which could be used as a weapon. The Soviets were developing particle beam lasers that could pinpoint any target on Earth. And the Rockefellers, knowing that the Soviets had the high ground with the satellites ever since they launched Sputnik back in the 50s, knew that the only place that an American or rather Rockefellerian uh, particle beam weapon would be effective was on the moon. So the Rockefellers began to use their power and influence to build a moon base in the Copernicus crater. I was first alerted to the existence of a secret base on the moon last November 1976, but it has been one of the best kept of all Rockefeller secrets, and it was only a few weeks ago that I was able to confirm its existence and learn the complete story. And since that time, events have moved with lightning speed. Throughout this year, an unseen but deadly race has been underway to see who would get an operational particle beam first, the Rockefellers at their secret moon base or the Soviet Union in Earth orbit. In July 1977, the Soviets launched a large satellite called Cosmos 929. Satellite watchers, Peter says, were mystified because the radio signals didn't make sense. But this was not any satellite. It was a manned particle beam weapon. And what's frightening is the Soviets had this particle beam weapon in orbit, but the American Rockefeller moon base was not yet finished. It wasn't yet fully constructed. Timber, while the American moon base is still being worked on, and that particle beam weapon is not ready yet, the Soviets were able to test Cosmos 929. They fired it into open space. Then they fired it at a target, an American spy satellite. It flew over southern Finland. It was blasted out of the sky by Cosmos 929. The satellite erupted into what Beter called an immense fireball of light. It was reported in the news, but not as a satellite attack. News reports that day in this country dismissed it all as a curious jellyfish-like UFO. So what happened to our Rockefeller moon base? By the 26th of September, American personnel at the secret Rockefeller moon base nestled in Copernicus Crater were almost ready. Their particle beam was almost operational, but they were too late. By late that day, the Soviet Union began bombarding the moon base with a neutron particle beam. Through the night and all day on September 27, the moon base was bombarded without mercy with neutron radiation, just like that produced by a neutron bomb. And by that evening, as Americans looked up at the peaceful full moon overhead known as the Harvest Moon, the last few Americans on the moon were dying of neutron radiation. America had lost the battle of the harvest moon. Well, that doesn't sound good at all. What are the consequences of this for the United States? My friends, in 1945, America became the first nation on earth to possess an awesome new super weapon, the atomic bomb. But now it is the Soviet Union that has won the race for a new super weapon, the particle beam that could be as decisive today as the atomic bomb was in 1945. The Rockefellers have disarmed America while betting everything on the moon base, thinking they would win the race, but they made a terrible miscalculation, and now we will all suffer the consequences. So there's two sets of bad guys here, right? There's the Soviets bad. The Rockefellers, bad may be worse. So you've got a battle between the two bad guys, and <laughs> no matter who wins, we lose, right? The Battle of the Harvest Moon was a turning point because it showed the Rockefellers as vulnerable. There were other twists and turns to come in the work that Dr. Beter was doing. In 1979, there would be 
a few things that would sort of throw a wrench into what uh, Beater was doing. One thing was that in um, oh January, yeah, January of 79, Nelson Rockefeller died. Uh, actually, the circumstances surrounding Rockefeller's death are, are pretty interesting. I won't go into it here, but um, lots of rumors that he was not alone, but with a young woman at the time of his heart attack. Beter would link this to Rockefeller being assassinated. And just like his brother, John D. Rockefeller III, uh, a little while earlier, having died in an automobile accident, Beter says we may never know the full story of what happened. Also in 1979, April 15th, 1979, uh, to be more precise, there was a story by Rudy Maxa in the Washington Post, sort of a profile of Dr. Beter and his ideas. The world outlook is grim. Very grim, says Peter Beter. What with the government's looting of the gold in Fort Knox, the toll cancer is taking on Jimmy Carter's body, the murder by gun of Nelson Rockefeller, and nefarious military, political, and economic plots too numerous to detail, Beter holds out little hope for average folks in the United States. The article goes on to detail Beter's ideas about the Battle of the Harvest Moon, the Rockefeller assassination or assassinations, depending on how you want to um, consider it, and tells us a little bit about his life outside of the conspiracy world. Beter's world seems one of dark plots and great vague forces, and he acknowledges that he is on a lonely patrol. Several weeks out of every month, he works alone at his K Street office or Bethesda home preparing his tapes. Then he jets via the Concorde to Europe where, from an office in Monte Carlo, he dispenses investment advice. He is a low-key and self-deprecating man who seems apologetic as he tells a luncheon companion all sorts of bad news, including word that the president has terminal cancer. Peter says he draws strength from living well with his wife and three children and daily meditation, sometimes on Our Lord, sometimes on Ramakrishna. For fun, sometimes, he flies up to Harvard to sit in on religion classes. Every time I make a tape, I pray and meditate for about an hour before, says Beter. It's more than just words that go into the tapes. It's spiritual vibration. People may say, I don't believe it. This man is way out. But once the seed is planted, they come back to the tapes. Okay, so what about these organic robotoids? I threw that phrase in the title because it sounded cooler than actually i'm not sure it does sound cooler than battle of the harvest moon actually i never come up with the title until after i'm done recording things so it, it might be battle of the harvest moon i'm not sure interesting i might have to i don't know i was like i should have everybody vote on it but it'll be too late by then you know recording things out of sequence is, is, is kind of like time traveling anyway what's with these organic Robotoids. Well, in April of 1979, not too long after that Washington Post profile, Dr. Beter began to tell a story, drop some hints about some things that were deeply disturbing. My friends, I realize that today, as in the past, many people are skeptical about what I have to reveal. After all, these things are probably contrary to what they have heard from friends, family, teachers, and the news media. They do not have my intelligence sources, and if I were to reveal these sources, they would dry up. But I believe that my duty is simply to reveal the truth, not cover it up just because it may be hard to accept. I've listened to a lot of Dr. Beter tapes over the years, probably more than any healthy, well-adjusted person should. And it's not often at all that you hear him say something like this, which, which basically amounts to, I know that what I'm about to say is absolutely bonkers, but take my word for it. My three topics this month are topic number one, the domestic Guyana at Three Mile Island. Topic number two, the secret intelligence war of doubles. And topic number three, last call for a pilgrimage for peace. Okay, so the intelligence war of doubles. What is this about? With the Rockefeller family in shambles, as Nelson and John have been killed, the Bolshevik takeover, the planned Bolshevik takeover of the United States is underway. 
Things are chaotic, but as far as Beter is aware, there's a plan to cause a war in the Middle East or some kind of crisis in order to instigate some kind of mass takeover. But something has thrown a wrench into those plans. But these and other plans have been thrown into question by recent eruption of intelligence warfare by means of doubles, lookalikes, and imposters. Lookalikes and imposters. Well, who is being looked alike and who is being impostered? Imposterized? Is that a word? I don't know. It's, it's early in the morning and I'm not sure how words work, but here is the story. For example, earlier this month on April 11th, Vice President Walter Mondale reportedly left Washington on a trip to Iceland, Scandinavia, and the Netherlands. But, my friends, the man and woman on Air Force Two were not Mondale and his wife, but actually doubles. The real Walter and Joan Mondale had been spirited away. The following day, Jimmy Rosalind and Amy Carter, the real ones, left the White House for a 10-day Easter vacation in Georgia. The first eight days were to be spent offshore in seclusion at Sepalo Island. Carter was looking more haggard by the day, racked by leukemia and multiple cancers. His visible loss of weight lately had prompted cover stories about his alleged success at dieting. He was fast losing the ability to work at all, and news stories said he was going to Georgia to seek solitude. And so for a week and a half surrounding Easter, the President and Vice President of the United States were out of public view. A few low-key reports appeared in the papers about the alleged activities of Mondale on his trip. Otherwise, all was quiet here in Washington. The real purpose of the trip by Mondale's Bolshevik double was to try to obtain oil for Israel, but in this the Mondale double failed because very recently Russia's Marshal Dmitry Ustinov, the man now in charge in the Kremlin, had visited Norway personally, and Norway has now come to terms with Russia. Okay, there's a lot going on here, but uh, the upshot is Mondale ain't Mondale. Mondale is a double. The Mondale you see is not the real Mondale. It's a fake Mondale. And Carter, well, there's, you know, he's looking rough, isn't he? He's looking rough. It's not a diet. It's the cancers, multiple cancers, and leukemia. He's eat up with it. He's going to drop. It's not the stress of the job, right? I mean, seriously, have you ever looked at a picture of somebody the day they enter the presidency and the day they leave? It's like they've been hit with an aging ray, right? It's a horribly stressful job. I can't imagine how anybody over the age of about 40 is able to handle it without just dropping dead. The answer is they do drop dead. They've been replaced by a double. So if Mondale is not Mondale, where is Mondale? I have never said the word Mondale more times in my entire life than I am this morning. The weekend after Easter, things happened fast, completely unseen by the public. On Friday night, April 20. The real Walter Mondale was being held incommunicado by Bolshevik captors in New Richmond in western Wisconsin. Sometime between 9.30 and 10 p.m. local time, Vice President Walter Mondale was executed. That's pretty grim. And it's interesting it happened in this, this tiny town of, of New Richmond, um, New Richmond, Wisconsin. That is very strange. Even, even today, New Richmond has about 10,000 people. Looks like a nice place in uh, St. Croix County, Wisconsin, out in the western part of the state. Beautiful country out there. So while all this is going on, what, what's, what's been happening to, to Jimmy Carter? I mean, how long can he survive being eat up with cancer like that? Well, maybe the Jimmy Carter we see is not the real Jimmy Carter. On Saturday, April 21, Jimmy Carter flew secretly from Georgia to Camp David, unaware that Mondale was dead. After lunch, he went to Bethesda Naval Hospital for a checkup on his cancer and then to the White House briefly. It was not until roughly 8 p.m. that night that the real Jimmy Carter returned to Plains. There, about 10.30 p.m., Jimmy Carter, President of the United States, was shot between the eyes. 
but incredibly he retained some signs of life. He was rushed from planes to Andrews Air Force Base outside of Washington, arriving shortly after midnight. By 2 a.m. Sunday, April 22, he was in surgery at Bethesda Naval Hospital. But it was hopeless, just as it was in 1963 when President Kennedy was shot in the head. With Rosalind Carter in shock, the body of the late President of the United States was disposed of quickly. That evening the real Rosalind Carter was at the White House under heavy sedation, but shortly after midnight she too was executed with a bullet between the eyes. That's, again, very grim. This whole doubles thing is in some ways just kind of a, I don't know if this is the best way to say it, but it's almost a dumbing down of the old Manchurian candidate idea where somebody was brainwashed into being an assassin or, or into to doing things that uh, that were harmful to the United States or whichever country they were aimed at. In this case, we don't have to, to mess with the, the complicated question of if and how mind control at that level works. No, we just kill the person and replace them with a double. Well, the problem is, one of the problems is, I mean, among the many problems here is the question of proof. How do we know that the Carter that we have now is not the Carter that we had before? During the past several days, Jimmy Carter number two, that is Carter's double, has been seen repeatedly in public, and what a change. Jimmy Carter No. 2 looks and acts ten years younger than the real Carter did. Listen now to the tired, halting voice of the old Carter as he read a prepared statement just 17 days ago on April the 10th. We have already begun to hear a good deal of talk from the oil companies about so-called plowbacks, but what this talk covers up is that this proposal, as it will be presented with the windfall profits tax, already provides $6 billion in increased revenue. Now compare that with the more shrill voice, forceful, vigorous, and confident of Carter No. 2 just two days ago on April the 25th. The bottom line is that if there is an effort to cheat on the SALT agreement, including the limits on modernizing ICBMs, we will detect it. My friends, the flat, awkward speaking style of the old Carter is gone. In its place is a new style of delivery which imitates the old Carter but has better phrasing and more lively inflection of the voice. I did not get that at all from what we heard. It's I guess if you want to hear it, you can hear it. You can pick out things that, that sound more lively, but maybe because in the first clip he was talking about tax policy, and in the second clip he was talking about you know, disarmament treaty violations. I mean, I know for me, one of those things is is way more sort of fun, than, fun's not the right word, um, energizing than the other. So where do these doubles come from? What is What is going on? with them. What are they? Is it just somebody dressed up to look like Jimmy Carter, or is it more insidious than that? When I recorded AUDIO LETTER 45 last month, the situation was confusing and my information was still fragmentary, but I told you what I could, and now I can tell you more. The War of Doubles involves not only the Bolsheviks, but the clandestine services of Russia, Great Britain, and Israel. But the basic battle lines are being drawn between Russia and the Bolsheviks. As of now, the Russians appear to be gradually gaining the upper hand thanks to their use of an astonishing new intelligence weapon. So the Russians are behind it in their battle against the Bolsheviks. I I don't understand entirely. Basically, there are two factions within Russia. There's the Russian government, and there's also the Bolsheviks, which represent world communism. It's it's kind of confusing, and it gets a little a little weirder than that. So we've got Russians behind the doubles. What are the doubles? In Russia, as well as in the West, research has been underway for many years in biological synthesis, that is, artificial life forms. 
and according to high intelligence a stunning breakthrough took place in Russia some years ago. The Russians refer to this breakthrough as a providential discovery, something they learned almost by accident. They discovered the key to creating what are known as organic robotoids. An organic robotoid is an artificial robot-like creature. It looks and acts exactly like a human being, and yet it is not human. A robotoid is alive in a biological sense, but it is an artificial life form. So, okay, these are basically clones. So how do you make one of these things? The pattern required is that of genetic coding taken from a few cells from the body of a human being. In this respect, the Russian technique sounds like cloning, but the technique itself is totally unrelated to genuine cloning. A robotoid is produced within a matter of hours and it simulates the human donor at his current age. Like any man-made copy of anything, a robotoid is never a perfect copy of the human that is to be simulated. There's always small discrepancies in appearance and behavior, but these are seldom great enough to arouse any suspicion. And there you have it. This is what's going on. And this would sort of be the hobby horse that Beter would ride for the rest of his audio letter career, that there is a secret war between various intelligence services and the Bol intelligence services and a conception he has of a, a, a Christian sort of good Russia, which is joining the battle against the um, the, the Bolshevik, uh, the Bolshevik hordes and the Rockefellers had kickstarted this, but the Rockefellers were sort of eliminated along the way. But it, it's, it's just fascinatingly, um, weird. Uh, Beter would die in 1987 and gave up his audio letters in, um, in the, the mid eighties as, um, as, as his health began to decline. He would uh, appear on other shows. Uh, he appeared with um, a guy named Sherman Skolnick, who was a conspiracy guy who was around for a long time. But his influence is, is interesting. He's not well known. And um, I, I do think it's, it's important to recognize, though, that some of these ideas that he has, that he kind of pioneered, have been consistent. The Battle of the Harvest Moon with the particle weapons and space weapons and moon bases, this is, this is very much a secret space program style conspiracy that has become very common in some aspects of UFO belief. The doubles are very similar to conspiracy theories nowadays where so-and-so President Biden or something has died and been replaced by a double. You see these things a lot. Michael Sala, exopolitics expert Michael Sala, has cited Dr. Beter in stories about cloning and leaders being replaced and his secret space program stuff. He uses Peter Beter as a source. You may have gotten you know, this hour into the show and wondered where are the UFOs in this episode, apart from the UFO being a cover story for the Soviet particle beam test. The answer is that while Dr. Beter may not have talked about UFOs, the UFO field and conspiracy theories surrounding the UFO field have adopted some of Dr. Beter's ideas over the years. And this doesn't mean that, that Dr. Beter is a UFO researcher. He absolutely is not. Um, but I was a little I was wondering a little bit whether or not I could make this work into a Saucer Life episode, this topic of Dr. Beter and the Battle of the Harvest Moon and the organic robotoids and what is very much a, a political conspiracy theory. And then I realized two things. One, yes, I could work it in. And two, I, it doesn't really matter if I can or not. It's it's my show. And, and we've veered away from saucery topics before. But I think Dr. Beter is interesting because he does set us down a course of these, these strange ideas that become kind of accepted down the road. Secret space weapons, doubles, um, even, even the, the idea of, of the reptilians, the Sherry Shriner style reptilians mimicking our, um, mimicking our leaders. This is, these ideas get, get entrenched, and I think it's absolutely fascinating.
thank you for listening. Remember to send in any questions and comments you have via the usual social media or email channels, and we'll be addressing those next time. Our associate producer is Simpson J. Hanover III, and The Saucer Life is a production of Chizo Media, LLC. Chizo Media, our heart is with the people. Till next time, keep watching the skies, because the organic robotoids are watching you.